you knew it was going to come up as soon as I you did it. I was like, oh, she's trying to stunt for the people. Right, right. So let, me, let me put her out here. Yes. This is awesome. Look at that you. And I used to, yep, develop my own black and white images. And, you know, I take photos of my family and, of course, all the outdoor scenes. And as I took a geology class to just learn more about, you know, the landscape and nature. And also, so this was the late seventies and now into the eighties when I was an undergrad, uh, Mount St. Helens erupted in the early eighties. And the first geology instructor I had, had like ash samples from Mount St. Helens. And I mean, he just made the connection to geoscience seem so relevant for us living here on the West coast, you know, even though that was a couple states North but I found myself just really connecting with the topic and, and it helped that I was able to get an internship at the US Geological Survey in Menlo Park when I was an undergrad and I had great mentors as a result of that internship and I got my first taste of field work at that time. So they took a group of us to Alaska one summer. I even helped to do some mapping along some dam site localities in Northern New Mexico. And I had no idea. I thought, you know, if science is like this, you know, why wasn't I more interested in my youth? But we know how kind of trapped, you know, science can be when you're studying it in the classroom. And, and I'm fortunate also to have grown up in San Francisco near the California Academy of Sciences in Golden Gate Park. So it's a natural history museum where I'm now very fortunate to be a fellow, but reflecting on my youth and, and just spending time at that museum. And that was one of my first connections with science in an informal setting where I, I you know, thought, okay, so it's more than just, you know, this sort of cookbook, textbook, doing an experiment in a classroom and that it involves these cool objects mm-hmm. is really, you know, fascinating. But I guess I kind of filed that away and yeah, just, uh, became more interested in the arts and was going to try to follow this photography path. And in some of the programs that I've directed over the years for youth that were like me, you know, urban youth who may not have made that natural connection to science, uh, we'd like to be able to offer, you know, that critical incident, you know, that that one experience to just to just grab them. And so maybe it's a field experience. Maybe it's a connection with a scientist at a museum, you know, or in my case, an internship, um, you know, at a federal agency. Mm-hmm. And so through that encouragement, um, just got the kind of, you know, advice and guidance to go to graduate school. And it was in graduate school that I began to focus more on, on microfossils. So, but again, that first seed came from that internship experience, which happened over several summers. And so I worked for a geologist and it was at this survey at that time where I first met some professional women in geoscience. And so connecting with them and getting that kind of mentoring and guidance, I think was really helpful to me in forming a science identity. And the coast ranges here in California, they're mostly made up of fine grained marine sedimentary rocks. So mudstones, chert, rocks that are full of microfossils. And so getting an introduction to the importance of microfossils and studying fine grained marine rocks was I think my first taste of just how valuable paleontology can be. Wow. And so during yeah, my Santa Cruz years and focusing on the Monterey formation of California, which is diatom rich, I honed my specialty in that and was also able to go out um, on some science cruise, multiple science cruises with the International Ocean Discovery Project and get that kind of experience working both at sea, you know, mm-hmm. and on land. Oh, wow. You mm-hmm. said so much. I had to start taking notes because my memory is not what it used to be. I had to, I had to start writing some stuff down. Okay. Wow. This is so awesome because, you know, you know, I met you at a conference. And, you know, and we talked a bit, but you don't know everyone's um, background and everything that you've done to get where you are now. And you really said a lot. So let me look back at my notes. Okay. And I'm happy, yes, to elaborate on. on 
I think what really stuck out to me was, um, stuck out to me was, I mean, your dad, you know? Um, it's interesting because for me, as a, bl- a first generation Black mm-hmm. student, that's what I always get. You know, it doesn't even matter. <laughs> I can just say I'm here, you know, I'm like, oh, you're first gen. Oh, you're first gen. You know, it's, it's an assumption. So I want to ask like a twofold, how was it not, I guess, being first gen? And have you had that assumption made of you like, oh, you're first, you know, how has, has that been your experience? Right. And yeah, and thank you for that question. And uh, because my sisters and I were surrounded by my parents and other academics, my father, who uh, was also a faculty member at Long Beach State University, uh, so also in the California State University system. And it was there that the Educational Opportunity Program uh, was started, was drafted by my father and his colleagues. And so that really opened the door for first generation college students, low income students of color to achieve. So he was always thinking about that next generation, students who might not have access, you know, arguing that the public universities in California should look like the state of California. And, you know, even through all that, um, my parents never put tremendous pressure on me or my sisters to attend college right out of high school. I guess they just assumed that we would. (laughs) And, And I also am fortunate where I didn't feel pressured to study a certain discipline. You see, I wandered, right? So, yeah. you know, it's been- look, look, here, Wait, wait, here it is. Let me oh, jump yeah. in. Yeah, it it up. <laughs> I'm like, oh, I should have kept that camera. It would have been a collected <laughs> item. <laughs> so they were cool, you know, and always encouraging if I want to do the art thing, photography thing, no problem. And then when I switched to geology, now I'm sure you hear this too, Tierra, where people are like, uh, what are you going to do with that? And in here, I'm from a family that, you know, is college educated, but I re- remember my dad asking, uh, well, do you want to be an engineer? I'm like, no, like geology is different from, no. What? And then he said what I'm sure many, you know, African-American students who are focused in science here, do you want to go to medical school? I'm like, no, I just I want to study. Oh, medicine. that's the number one. You got to go to medical school. I got to go. You know, we're trying to change that narrative. But that's so typical even now where we know more about the sciences that are applied or that involve you know our well-being or that are practical that lead to jobs so yeah there was there was battling that so you know being the kind of you know having a just really a first gen psyche in geoscience could you know or and did lead to like a fair amount of pressure like well i better not blow this now that i'm committed to this field and I really had no idea where it would take me you know the USGS years were so formative as a student but I had trouble looking beyond that I thought well I'll just be a lab tech like I'm cool working here yeah doing Uh these projects but um the the constant kind of encouragement I think you know really all students need that includes sharing just the possibilities and so with that, I just went straight on to, to graduate school, to a PhD program. And not knowing then uh, that there were terms for the things that we it continue to experience, like, you know, the stereotype thread and just feeling like you don't belong and always questioning, um, you know, am I in the right place and right. not realizing the kinds of, you know, judgment and misjudgment you know, I would experience from others towards me that, you know, are all intertwined, of course, with the biases that we, you know, learn, know so much more about now. Um, But I just, a lot of times, I honestly just put my head down and went to work because I knew how much I enjoyed the field. It's like, you know, something about this discipline, you know, sure it's odd and I still don't know what I'm gonna do with my degree, but I'm enjoying myself and I'm fascinated by deep time and all of the applications of of fossils. And so I try to share that um, with the the students I work with, um, whether they're college students or pre-college, that when you find a topic you like in science, then, you know, just to stick with it and you never know what sorts of opportunities will 
outcome because of that. Right, right. So you, I mean, bring up a lot because we know being Black women in this field is, it's rough. I mean, we, we go through a lot of these things where we just, you know, put our head down. It's like, oh, because if I cause a scene, I'm going to be seen as aggressive. I'm going to seem as a complainer. I'm going to seem as a problem. Mm -hmm. And so we just choose to really deal with it. But I thought it was interesting that you said um, in the beginning, you were talking about that you did when you were coming into the field, you did see women in geoscience. Yep. So work, I'm, assu I'm assuming <laughs> these were white women, but yes. what types of women did you see and how was that experience? Right. Well, it, it certainly shaped um, my thinking about who, who are the members, you know, of this discipline. And so the faculty at San Francisco State in, in geoscience and geology, they were all very encouraging, you know, I must share. And even though I didn't have any women faculty members, the balance with the female um, scientists at USGS, I think was just a, a great way to kind of round out those early influences. But, but yes, all of the women geoscientists that I interacted with were white women but I was also part of a program that was um, for underrepresented students interested in geoscience. So at least I had a cohort. Mm -hmm. um, I definitely had other students, my peers, that we could relate to each other. And even when we were challenged, um, you know, we we had each other. But there are you know stories along the way of just trying to fit in, you know, to this science. And even though I felt connected to the science, there are all the questions, even though I had, you know, peers I could share my feelings of inadequacy with, um, they were feeling the same way too, because it's like we all just got dropped on the moon, you know, or dropped in Alaska, literally, you know, and what was kind of, was very much, you know, a, a foreign landscape, and we're still acquiring, you know, the tools and the approaches. And one of my favorite stories to tell from those years while I was an undergraduate intern at the USGS was being on a field party in Alaska. So it was my first time, you know, backpacking, working in high altitudes, you know, okay. we were transported. Yeah, but I was like, woo, okay, I'm getting my, <laughs> a real training now. And, um, and the, this, the woman who supervised our field party, you know, she was, I, I think um, she epitomized many women geoscientists of that era where, I mean, you had to be tough, like you had to be crazy, you know, tough because of the environment that, you know, produces that competitiveness and the survival uh, um, instincts. And so I didn't understand at the time why she was so hard on me. I'm thinking, well, you know, we're female geoscientists. I didn't get the whole tough love approach. Of course, now I know, you know, all the things that she must have had to put up with. Um, in her own training and, you know, the constant questioning and, and doubt by, you know, the, the men who definitely, you know, were uh, the, the stereotypical leaders in geoscience at the time. But I'm just trying to keep up, you know, I'm in awe of this landscape in Alaska, you know, I'm fascinated by just how field work all comes together. And again, some of the seeds were being sown for interest in paleontology and fine grained sedimentary rocks. And we're working on these, uh, what we call accretionary complexes in Alaska. So much of the uh, central Alaska range was built by these uh, blocks of ocean crust and uh, even seamounts and other fragments, uh, fragments of other parts of crust that were all accreted or uh -huh. attached to the land. So in between all those terrains were deep marine rocks, muds that need studying. So yeah, it's definitely connecting with the science. But but you know, Dr. Moore, they didn't in those days they didn't exactly tell you like what to bring in the field besides, you know, your backpack, the tent, right. and, you know, clothes to stay warm, a tent, good boots, all that. So I'm thinking, oh well we're gonna be out here for, you know, two, three weeks. We're gonna need some music, right? And this was like way before we had music in our phone, you know, no, of course, cell phones in, nothing portable. So I'm just, you know, again, still loving the arts and music. So I had one whole backpack, like filled with an old school tape um, cassette player and like a dozen cassette tapes, you know. So I figured we're going to be at the campsite, right? 
So no. we're gonna need some music. And I, did, I don't know. Again, stupid stuff. But, you but don't it's know. so true. You're right. You're yeah. right. So I'm like, oh, this backpack was supposed to hold the rocks. Like, from, I'm just like, oh, how am I gonna fit? I can't even be, you know, a good field assistant because I have like music in this backpack. <laughs> of course, I was found out, you know, I was trying to just hide it on the sneak. But, you know, midway through this day where we have a long trek and all our packs are heavy and I'm not keeping up. So all my cassette tapes and this tape recorder, it wasn't quite a ghetto blaster, but, you know, it was enough, <laughs> like all spilled out of my backpack. I was like, oh, so then of course I got towed off. Like I'm already feeling awkward in this environment. And now I really don't fit in. So there were some moments that summer I thought, you know, maybe I'm out of here. Maybe I, you know, I clearly don't fit the stereotype. The way they're perceiving my behavior is very unfit for this. You know, I upset the cultural norm, even though no one explains what the culture is. I feel it becomes clear. Right. But anyway, I survived all that and I was like, but you know, it makes you stronger. And I usually just default to something good about the experience. And there was enough that was good that I thought, well, this will make a good story. So <laughs> later on when I'm doing field work with, you know, students or youth, I have to remember this, that everybody needs, you know, I think some acclimation to, to field work. Right. And I think you made a good point and I had wrote this down, um, but transitioning to thinking about you as, you know, a scientist now, a paleontologist now, you know, a doctor now, a mentor now, how do you think your experiences shaped how you mentor students? Yeah, they really do um, shape it in, in fundamental ways. Um, the years before I came to Berkeley, so I've been the education director at the Museum of Paleontology for eight years. And before that, I had a long, a 22 year career at San Francisco State University. So I came back to my alma mater Hi, okay. faculty. So they hired me right out of graduate school when I finished at UC Santa Cruz. So my wow. position there, you know, it, was, it was very teaching uh, focused, even though I was still doing research with the International Ocean Discovery Program. I had my Monterey Formation projects and, you know, it, it was quite a lot, you know, teaching geology, paleontology, oceanography, but I was always really drawn to uh, community partnerships and educational collaborations because, you know, I was still in my hometown. So uh, with faculty members at San Francisco State in geosciences during those years, uh, we received funding for a program we called SF Rocks. So reaching out to communities and kids mm -hmm. with science in San Francisco. So we would um, recruit high school students from uh, high schools in the city to work with us on research projects. Later on, the program expanded with additional funding. So we partnered with UT El Paso and University of New Orleans and Purdue University to bring students from all of our regional areas on field trips. And so here I was now in the lead on a field trip with students who don't have that many outdoor experiences, but we wanted them to have the kind of enjoyment that, that many of us have in our science. And and so, you know, clearly in, in the years where we could, you know, safely do field work, we just took full advantage of being able to take literal caravans. You know, we'd be 15 cars deep sometimes with okay. students and all the mentors. And so funny story from that too, but which helps answer the question of what sort of, you know, mentor am I and what do I keep in mind from my early experiences in my geoscience training? that I want to pass on to youth. So one of the years we're meeting the groups from New Orleans and from El Paso and Purdue um, in Utah that year. So we're driving from California and, you know, we're making stops, you know, that's, that's how we do it. In right. science field trips, you know, we make various stops and make sure that we're learning along the way. And of course, before the field trip, we spent a lot of time, we talked to parents about where we're going. We had a guidebook. We did some early training, you know, in rock and mineral ID, introduction to fossils, deep time, you name it. So one of our first stops was this place um, in Idaho that's got 
these beautiful canyons, you know, that are cut into these dark basaltic rocks. And it's very dramatic, you know, the <laughs> landscape there. So we get out, and of course, I'm excited. You know, all the instructors are excited. And one student, like the first thing he says to me is, is this real? And I'm like, what? I, is it, I didn't understand the question at first, you know, because no one had ever asked me that. And then I got kind of angry because I thought now we've been talking about <laughs> yeah, for, <laughs> for I don't know how long. <laughs> and these programs cost money. And you're gonna ask me, right, did somebody make this up? Or like, it's not like the fake rocks at Disneyland. And But wow. anyway, when, you know, I cooled down and when we got through his question and I finally listened, I realized, you know, there's not that much that prepares someone for just the natural beauty of the, or that kind of scene, you know, that scale of, um, you know, of landscape, if you don't have that kind of training. And, and so not everything we see as scientists, whether we're a bench scientist or a field scientist, or we do our research on ships, you can't assume that someone will, you know, see science the way you do. And, and that's what training is, is all about. And so I still believe, you know, in that just fundamental need to guide students and uh, assist them in finding their way in the science, um, you know, whatever branch of geoscience or paleontology they like, having that direct experience and then not judging, you know, just don't judge, let there be freedom to ask, you know, a question about what they might be seeing because not everyone has an opportunity to go to these places in Utah or stop at this canyon or, you know, go to Yellowstone. And so that's why we need um, those programs. And, and even though we've switched a lot of those now to virtual, one of my projects at the Museum of Paleontology focuses on virtual field experiences and, you know, working with colleagues, faculty at other universities who have a lot of expertise and the kind of um, remote delivery of field experiences is a really great learning, teaching and learning opportunity mm -hmm. for us. Mm -hmm. Wow. So there was a lot. I think um, what I got a lot of what you were talking about is like the assumptions, you know, that people can have when you're used to like, you know, going on family trips and camping trips and you see all this stuff all the time. You know, I can definitely remember my first time, like, you know, seeing like, just being outside as a scientist or as like as a student who was learning and truly had a background of like, oh, this is this is a structure, right? And this means something and this is what it is. And it's like, oh snap, like this is so cool. And so for people to like scoff at that, like, ugh, or like, <laughs> like, like dang, I was having a moment. Like and you never look at the landscape the same, right? Right. And around you, you want them to see, you know, what you notice too and see once you get bitten by that bug and I just want people to get just bitten by that science bug and you just look at the world differently and right. you'll just really inspired you know to just to just go to work and share share it with us. so something else maybe we're going to go a loop around to ask the question <laughs> so you mentioned um being in like a diversity cohort right. um and I was also in some like I guess like kind of cohort type program where you know they kind of like yeah you just say like plop here you go like you know we'll pay for you to come right. you know we'll give you a little stipend but right. then that, that's really it and I think there is an assumption that that's enough and it's like I, it's, it's it's kind of hard I feel like my nerves getting up as I'm talking about this because I don't want to ever seem ungrateful or all this but the experience wasn't the best to be honest, like, you know, I, I was plopped in and left, left for dead, <laughs> to be honest. So it's like, why is there an assumption that that's enough, like to get the black students there and then, you know, there's nothing else that happens. So what was your experience, I guess, with the diversity cohort you were in and how do you feel about that whole thing? Okay, well, cohorting is key. And I think many of the early diversity programs just assumed, as you said, you know, we're, we're going to plop you over here, but it'll be an exciting environment and you'll be supported by a stipend. You know, you'll, you'll learn so much. It'll be good for your career. And they often, those early programs didn't take into account the whole student, 
the mentoring, the kind of isolation that can be typical at a science facility. And that's real. I mean, I'm sure we can both share examples of student who just got out, you know, after that, even though it seemed like everything was set up for them to be successful. But if you don't acknowledge that uh, there can be feelings of isolation, that people need other things besides the, the science to keep them successful. Uh, and, and so I suppose one way, um, you know, I was able to overcome that. Well, you know, it was helpful that those of us um, in the program during those summers uh, did come in together. And so we were from different, you know, Bay Area universities and, and two year colleges. And so even though we all kind of got thrown in together, you know, at least we had each other. And mm -hmm. you know what happens? We'd have our side meetings and, or just have, Again, we didn't even know what to call the sessions, but we just make them ourselves that, you know, if we needed to talk with each other or if we just need a little bit of support. Um, and so when I've designed and, you know, carried out various programs for students, we've just tried to consider all of that, you know, making sure that they have opportunities to work in groups, that they don't feel isolated, that They'll need, you know, mentoring, advising, um, and some guidance. And and I'm noticing now too, you know, I was recently asked to uh, review and contribute to a manual that the REU programs, the research experience for undergrad programs, could use. And so they're making sure, you know, there's a section on inclusive principles and oh, yes. you know, diversity and equality and that has to be as important a part of the science training as all the technical skills. And so we're getting there, I think finally, but you know, look what it's taken to acknowledge that. But I, I've worried a long time over the years about just losing students. And I see it in graduate school too. I mean, you know, Berkeley is a crazy environment and you can't um, expect that, you know, all the students of course are gonna come from exactly the same background and training, but they're there. And so they should be led to believe that they have equal opportunity to achieve. But just, you know, the socialization of graduate school, the competitiveness, the, you know, faculty pressures that lead them to focus more on, you know, the technical training of their students and not so much the whole student is, um, you know, is, is still a, a barrier. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I think it's just, it is interesting because we're also in spaces that are, you know, we're not just the only person in the department as far as, you know, if we're on faculty. So imagine, you know, you have a diversity program, you bring in a, you know, a couple of black students, but then yeah. if you're whole, the rest of the department isn't doing anything. Right. Then, you know what, <laughs> you know, and I think that's what was my experience. I feel like we had people, we had a few people who had, brought, oh, we need black people. But then the whole rest of the department was still not diverse. So it was like, yep. but, you know, so it was this that, that isolating experience that you talk about where it's like we're feeling like we're bought in as the diversity initiative. People make comments. You know, I remember um, someone making a comment in our department saying that they felt the quality of their degree went down once our, our we came in. And, you know, that was just like so disappointing to hear, first of all, from someone who's supposed to be my peer, someone I'm supposed to be looking up to because they're an older student than I am. And, yep. but that's what they're saying about us because we are seen as these, this, this group, oh, they found a bucket of money. Now they're going to bring in these black people. So right. it's disappointing. Um, and I so, <laughs> yeah. And so it's like, <laughs> sorry, go ahead. Oh, no, I just didn't say, yeah, totally agreeing with everything you have to say. And, and somewhere in those conversations about diversifying the student pool or even the faculty or now in the work I do with the professional societies, AGU and GSA, we want to ensure that the honors and fellows, the awards uh, go to uh, diversity of people, you know, in our societies. But somewhere in there, someone always inserts, well, we have to change the criteria then. You know, we have to reshape what, you know, we're defining as excellent or as worthy of this award. It's like, no, you know, our many times our scholarship or what we bring, you know, as scientists, as, you know, experienced educators should count, you know, as highly as, 
you know, whatever they're measuring other folks by, but, but we have still work to do when it comes to that, because there's still this perception that, yep, if you're recruiting members of diverse communities to your programs, that there's some separate criteria for them or that they bring, yep, the program and directions that are lesser than, and you know, those old arguments. Which is just like such, mm -hmm. it's just, it's just like, really? You know, because it's like, there are so many different stereotypes for like brown and black people, but like the good ones never follow up. Cause you know, it's like, oh, it's like, oh, they're hard workers. But when it comes to like being minorities in the scholarship that was just given to us, oh, hold up. Like how did that happen? Like how did that narrative just change really quick? So I think now though, and I want to talk to you about this is, are you seeing a shift, I guess, in some of those same people Mm -hmm. now hitting you up <laughs> now really you know <laughs> now trying to be like hi I'm uh, now I <laughs> well you could answer this too I'm sure but so many <laughs> black professionals in STEM we've been saying since May since the George Floyd murder and all of the social upheaval you know our phones are blowing up our inboxes are full with requests that would, yeah, would not have been there a year ago. And, and so on the one hand, I'm thinking good, because I've been at this for a while now. You know, I've been working on diversity, equity, and inclusion my whole career. I mean, even as a, even as a graduate student, I mean, I have to do it on the sneak, but I was always looking to help out at a science fair, you know, partner with other students and STEM disciplines when I was at Santa Cruz to, you know, build community and to do things that extended off the campus, you know, this, that's just what we do, you know, we, we give back. And I just made certain that I made it a priority during my faculty years and, and being at San Francisco State where service is valued, you know, as much as teaching is and research, I did feel the freedom to do that sort of work, you know, the broader impacts work and that I would get credit for it, you know, for tenure and promotion. But I know that's not how it is for everyone. I'm still parts of lots of discussions um, with, you know, early career scientists about how much they should be spending on the things, you know, that we traditionally call service. But, um, but you can't expect that anything's going to change, you know, unless there's some equal respect for, you know, diverse members of our science community and that, you know, you, you hear us out and realize all there is to learn. I know, you know, one of the questions you had uh, on the list was about just allyship, you know, and what we should be expecting now from members of our community that aren't from traditionally underrepresented groups. And I've been, you know, fortunate to be uh, part of a growing number of uh, science, geoscientists of color that are trying to move beyond the petitions and statements that came out, you know, right after the George Floyd murder. And I think those were important. I mean, universities were standing in solidarity, our professional societies, you know, letting it be known that, um, you know, we need to work harder as a community to be anti-racist and blah, 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 blah. But, you know, the rubber hitting the road, you know, what does that really mean in our disciplines where they're just so rooted in all this tradition and the expectation that, you know, you're only going to study certain things or that you have to go about it a certain way or that we only hire people from this university. And they just sometimes just weren't even listening, you know, to, yeah. I think, the valuable contributions we can make about extending you know, collaboration so that we are having, you know, kinds of partnerships with communities that also benefit from good science or that can, you know, make observations and contribute to the science. So, so while I'm inspired and, you know, I mean, look at this whole week we're having and folks are retweeting, they're tuning in. I mean, they're definitely listening and looking to all of us for advice, but but they have to be willing to take the advice and, you know, help us just dismantle some of these power structures and rethink how it is we educate people and what do we expect professionally, um, you know, as we claim we want to, you know, diversify. 
the geosciences. Exactly. And so I guess the following up with that, which was so eloquently said, thank you. Um, how does it feel, I guess, as like an OG, you know, original, <laughs> original person who has been in the streets, like, you know, really talking and like yelling into this, you know, storm of people just not listening and to see, you know, movements like, you know, Black and STEM, um, yep. Black in STEM, Black AF in STEM, you know, all love the Black, <laughs> all of them, all the way to now we're in Black and geoscience. Like we went from yes. STEM to geoscience, like, right. what? You know, and right. we're even smaller. So how does that feel? Like, how do you feel about these movements knowing that you have been in these streets, you know? Right. Well, it feels great. And even my family um, this week, as I was sharing with them what was going on, they still couldn't believe you're really, you're not the only one anymore. Like there's a whole new generation. I'm like, yes. Oh. And I, so I love that other people are recognizing that sure, our numbers are small, you know, compared to the life sciences or, um, you know, other branches of science, but, but we're vocal and, and with people just paying more attention, you know, to all the global conditions. I mean, Tiara, it is dark outside, you know, it's, I mean, the fire, the smoke from the fire, it's, it could be 1030 at night and not 1030 AM. And, right. and so you just have to notice now, you know, what extreme conditions that we live in, how much the natural world is changing and folks are just way more in tune with what um, geoscience is all about and why we study the earth, why it's so important. And, um, you know, there, there's just some truth to things paying off after a while, you know, even when it wasn't popular to work on diversity programs or, or even coming to Berkeley and wanting to prioritize diversity programs in a museum setting. I mean, I always felt supported, but, you know, there's a certain amount of pressure. It is Berkeley after all to you know, bring in a, a, an array of grants and they don't necessarily, you know, have to all be about diversity, but we, and one of my main roles is to promote uh, the many rich, you know, online learning modules that we have connected to our websites. Um, in addition to supporting graduate students at our museum on their training, many of whom I think really value opportunities to dive into to broader impacts. But now, you know, with everything that's happened this spring, uh, there's been so much additional support from the museum that I truly value. You know, we have a working group now on diversity, equity, and inclusion and anti-racism. Huh? We've really rethought uh, some of the ways in which we share information on our websites and we want to be more inclusive in that. Um, when we're able to return, you know, to field and in-person instruction, I've got some exciting partnerships with the International Ocean Discovery Program to get students out to see, and then also really re-examining field work. You know, you, you notice that as I shared my own journey, field work in my training uh, is, you know, something I love to share. And, and, it, and that we're rethinking field work. I mean, separate from the pandemic, I think we were long overdue to really think about uh, those sort of classic expectations and geoscience training that are held over, you know, from another generation that might not be relevant today. I mean, we know students that do their whole dissertation, you know, modeling, never go in the field or just work with big okay. data and that's as valuable as going out in the field. And I mean, we've got 5 million fossils in our collection at the Museum of Paleontology at UC Berkeley, do, do we really need to go in the field, you know, for more thought? Sometimes the field is examining collections at museums and you've got wonderful tools now to digitize and image them in three dimensions and share information and databases that I think, you know, we never had access to before on that big scale. And so I think between the new tools we can use Mm -hmm. and um, the need to just keep informing others how relevant, you know, our discipline is just keeps me inspired on, on what we can achieve. So yeah, whatever sacrifices I had to make all the years, I worked on this even without, you know, big grants was, was still totally worth it. And so, yep, if I can inspire 
all of you and this next generation of the importance of this work, then let's just all do this, you know, together. Thank you. Because we definitely need, I feel like without the voices of the past, like we wouldn't be here because you had already been talking and they saw you. It's like, oh yeah, there is this, oh, there it, you know? Yeah. And I think that just left space for us to be where we are today. And I think there is the movement, you know, with Black Lives Matter that is causing white people to listen a lot yeah. more. But I'm glad that because we were already experiencing these things and we were already vocal, that we were able to jump right on it, you know, because nobody can say I wasn't already talking about diversity in STEM, talking about the things that I was going through. So once tapped on my shoulder, here yeah. I am, <laughs> Come yeah. up, you know, so I'm grateful that we as Black people were actively and prepared because of you. To oh, know. well, when I met you at ASLO, I, I, you know, I remember being so impressed with all of your levels of activity with the student chapters in Aslo, and then you know, even your own history, how you got involved in, you know, marine science and ecology. And I was as fascinated because I kept thinking, wow, well, if I had known like what you knew when you were, I don't know, maybe I would have had a Nobel prize now or something. <laughs> right. Oh, yeah, wait, now that means I got to go get a Nobel. <laughs> I know. I'm working on it to the Nobel Prize people if you're yes. listening. <laughs> okay. Oh, <laughs> um, but we've talked a lot about like different field experience experiences. Um, you know, we have our Black in the Mud panel later yeah. today that is gonna really be highlighting field yeah. experiences. Um, right. but then you just made a point of maybe you don't have to go into the field, you know, at all. Like you can be, you know, where how we is now, how we how we are now, like in your house behind your computer. So right. what, how do we um, let the people know this, like get the, you know, the, the next generation excited about being a geoscientist and having all these options. And just you alone, you've talked about, you know, cruise experience, museum yeah. experience, camping experience, hiking experience, all these different things. Yeah, so what do you have to say, I guess, for the little ones? The little ones, little ones. Yeah, well, well I'm definitely trying to keep it going and I'm participating in a whole range of, you know, virtual opportunities to talk with students and, and share the science. Um, you know, I'm fortunate to work with some great graduate students at, at UCMP. And so they've converted a whole series of labs that we had. We've been partnering with community colleges in the Bay Area, you know, recognizing that those kinds of connections are important if we want to build diversity in geoscience and in the paleontological sciences. And so we've been working with community college instructors so that their classes could spend a lab period at the museum and graduate students would lead a lab that was uh, fossil focused. And so now we've converted all of those labs um, to the virtual. And even when we are able to meet back again in person and able to bring students out in the field, I, I think there's a definite part of you know teaching and learning online that's going to be here to stay and if and if that allows us to reach groups you know beyond where we live and um you know connect in a way that maybe we wouldn't have put as much time and energy into then that's great and so so i'm trying to just keep um you know a, a few different kinds of of balls in the air and projects that mm -hmm. Uh, do take advantage of opportunities, you know, to teach and learn in person when we're able to, and then the virtual, and then also, you know, with, with support from some of the different NSF programs and initiatives, there continues to be a fair amount of attention on working with leadership. So, you know, we're, we're still depending on the faculty and professionals, scientists of color, to do a lot of the leading, you know, in diversity, you know, look how busy we all are now. And, right. and you know, and we're expert, we have our own personal journeys and many of us, you know, we're directing or are directing programs, but the responsibility should lie with all of us. And so I'm really looking forward to opportunities to work with um, other PIs and faculty who want to be, you know, initiators of change, who want to be change agents, but that maybe they don't really know how or the department is still stuck and so homogenous that how do you even get started? And so we're trying to just build these communities um, 
and opportunities to learn through workshops on just strategies, you know, to start to build more diverse practices and programs. Oh, the- that's really awesome. So yeah. you, you actually mentioned a lot of different programs that you're involved with or mm-hmm. um, initiatives that you're doing. So how, let the people know how they can get involved Great. Uh, with what the things that you have working on, or if you want help, you know, this is, this is the moment. <laughs> yes. In fact, there'll be opportunities for graduate students um, with a few colleagues who I've worked with on uh, this field project. So field is an acronym. So field work, uh, inspiring expanded leadership and diversity. And wow. one can, so if you, if you go to the UCMP homepage, so it's just UCMP.berkeley edu or if you google you know um, you see museum of paleontology so on our home page we have a section of the page that's about diversity inclusion and so uh, you'll see a lot of my programs there um, but yeah but one of the things I wanted to share um, is that uh, with these programs and so I've tried to really keep it reflective of well all, all of my subdisciplines you know so even though I specialize in microfossils, you know, my broad training in paleontology, you know, includes really lots of different kinds of invertebrates. So one of the projects we have is about virtual field experiences to invertebrate paleontology sites here on the West Coast. Wow. Part of my training is Ocean Science Connected. So I've got these great partnerships with IODP and with colleagues that direct the STEM Seas program. So that's for undergraduates to go out on um, research vessels. Uh, and then I like to think that, you know, m- much of my training was also in the solid earth geosciences. And so thinking about transitioning those traditional field expectations and degree programs to uh, expectations now that reflect the modern era. So um, being able to uh, uh, engage in field work remotely, you know, incorporating data and visualization into uh, field training and working with instructors to do that. And so as we've tried to really think about including more diversity in field connected sciences, we'll have opportunities to work with graduate students to be these field fellows as we call them. And so uh, they can also receive this kind of training and think about, you know, what it really means to incorporate, um, you know, a a field based uh, science or field based data collection. So, so yeah, I'll continue to share that out on that. I know that, you know, hashtag, Black and Geoscience Week will continue to be active, right? And so I can hey. share Twitter when I'm recruiting for programs. Please do. Day. We will definitely retweet your stuff. Let yeah. you tag us any. And I just want to take a moment. I almost got teary eyed. I am so proud of you. Can I just say that? Like, oh my goodness. Like, this is just so amazing to hear about these things that you are doing and like, as a black woman, this is just just so awesome. I know like for me, like again, like getting here and being in these rooms where it's just me and feeling like, oh my gosh, yeah. should I be doing this? Could I go do anything else? You know, because I feel like I could, you know, do by anything else in Excel because as a black woman. <laughs> so so to get here and to still be in a room, you know, by myself, but with yes. you and to hear about the things that you're doing that I didn't even know about just to keep Thanks. our, to keep our field thriving with, with diversity is like, my heart is full. Like, I thank you. Oh, you're welcome. And well, you know, it's a lot of work, but I certainly have help in this effort. And, and honestly, though, there are times when I still get some, you know, feelings of stereotype threat. I'm like, no, I am too old. You know, I've been in this. But, you know, you find yourself in a room and, you know, with each new challenge or a different environment. I'm like, wow, you know, all of a sudden, I'm like, wow, I really am the only black person in this room or, you know, the only woman of color. Or it's like, oh man, we, you know, you just get shaken up. It's like, okay, you just get reminded. We still have a lot of work to do. I mean, I have all my comfort zones and yeah, and programs that, you know, I've been fortunate to receive funding for, to expand that, 
you know, the feel good programs and reflect mm -hmm. the things I love to do, which is, you know, study fossils or go in the field or being able to partner with the whole range of museums and other universities to excite students about science. But, but then every once in a while, you know, you get in a different or new environment. It's like you're starting from square one, you know, so, right. so there's still that, but that's why, yeah, just try to, you know, keep it moving as we say, and just stay connected. I mean, I'm just, I'm sociable, you know, I love working with people and meeting new folks and, you know, working with the next generation because everybody's so full of ideas and, and it, think of what we've been able to accomplish, you know, just this spring with, with everything going on, you know, with all the negative, just conversations about, you know, diversity and inclusion that are flipping. I'm like, we're going to lose this at any moment. People are, you know, are down with the, the mission now, but you know, we know what a lot of burnout. Yeah, burnout is real. We know. Yeah. Oh we yeah. Know. <laughs> we know that, and we can't get like, tired. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So we, so there has to be room for folks to step back, and you know, we can't do it all at once. If whatever conversations we keep going, I think it's helpful if we remind each other that we're in this for the long haul, right? Where there's no going back now. So and we just have to, you know, keep pressuring and and making sure that it state remains a priority, you know, to just right. diversify enough already. We know what some tools and actions work. And there clearly are resources that help these initiatives. So let's just try to be more strategic, you know. And I think you really summed it up enough already. Like y'all know what it is. Y'all yeah. know what's up. Enough yes. already. <laughs> like, oh. Enough already. Yes. <laughs> right. So let's just, let's get to work. That's uh, the hard part, I know. But if we've learned anything from all this, it's like, we've just got to be, you know, more strategic and focused on some maybe short term and then middle and longer term goals. But we're just not going back anymore. You know, it's just, we can't keep you know, pressing opportunity, we can't ignore, you know, the benefits of having more diversity in our discipline, again, especially now, you know, given all the environmental pressures, right. people are sick, we're unhealthy, we're not getting, you know, the kinds of, I think, basic information that science can offer about, you know, how best to live your life and get that opportunity. So yeah, if we can even extend, you know, geoscience to health and wellness and just, you know, creating a better life for our communities, then I, you know, would be very happy, happier. <laughs> so we are at time. I want to ask you a last question. So while you think about it, um, I'm going to wrap up. So what do you think retired Lisa is going to be the most proud of. What do you think the retired Lisa is going to be? What is she going to say? So oh. while, you're, while you're thinking about that, thank you, everybody. I don't, I'm don't. i assuming people are watching because <laughs> we're live. We might have just been talking to ourselves for the last hour, but it doesn't matter because my heart is full. Okay. Um, we have up next, we will be taking over the 500 Women Scientists account, and that's going to be at 3 p.m. Um, EDT. So head over to the Instagram, 500 Women Scientists, and we'll have some more geoscientists talking to you there. All righty, Dr. Lisa White. Okay. What is what is retired Dr. Lisa White? <laughs> oh my God. Well, I um I certainly hope, you know, at when I'm retired that we would have, you know, sown more and just deeper seeds of, of activism in the next generation of geoscientists. And I'm seeing that already. I mean, as I said, when I was a grad student, we had to do some of these education no projects and diversity projects on the sneak, but many graduate students now and postdocs are just out front with it and see it as really essential to their own professional development and training. Mm -hmm. uh, and so if that's just some of the legacy that folks like me, you know, who've been working on these programs for decades leave, then that's really wonderful. And, it, and I often, you know, you get pe people say, oh, don't work so hard. Why are you doing all these programs? 
what do you, it's like, I don't know. I try not to work all the time, but you know, when you like your work and, th- and plus we get benefits, right? When we're able to travel and go to right. places and, you know, go to these great international conferences, there's something that's very rewarding about our work. But yeah, I just hope just that spirit of activism and science is here to stay. You know, we can't leave the activism to the social scientists. Uh, we very much need to be in the, in the lead um, as, as physical and um, natural scientists. Well, thank that, you for this. That, yeah, thank you so much. That was awesome. So well put. Thank you so much. You know, I'm so grateful. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, that you know a- you had different interests and in that you made your yeah. way over here from photography yeah. to science and I can have this conversation with you today and work with you in the future and okay. I'm just so grateful thank yeah. you all so much please thank enjoy the rest of Black in Biosphere and Black in Geoscience week and I'll see you online I'm all righty thank you so much Dr. Moore it was a great day bye all right Woody. <laughs> Okay, have a great day. Thank you.